Welcome to the first episode of Series 32, everyone! This series, we have guests Celeste Konowich and Eugenio Vargas to teach us about Burn Bright. But first, we, before we get to that, we have a few announcements for you. First up, uh, we are down to the last few days of the Skyjacks album Kickstarter. As of this recording, it is approaching $40,000. And if it hits $45,000 before the end, it'll hit the final stretch goal where Arnie Parrott teams up with Tyler Davis to create a brand new song for the next arc of campaign Skyjacks, uh, which sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. So uh, absolutely check that out. Next up, as of this last week, we officially passed the 200,000 downloads mark. Ooh. We both wanted to thank all of you so much for helping us get past this milestone. Um, to those of you who've been with us since the beginning, and all of you who are new to listening, thank you so much for your support. Yeah, thank you. It means the world to us. It really, really does. This mm -hmm. has been such a fun ride for the last, like, what has it been? Two, year and a half? Two, two? two, two and a half years, yeah. Oh my gosh, two and a half years. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Almost exactly. It was like April 2nd, I think, was the it, it first really was. official episode. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Wow, what two a crazy and a half. two and a half years, Ryan. I know. <laughs> so much has changed. So much. Like, you have a whole new uh, family member. I have one less family member. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that's just called balance. That's right. We're just trying to, obviously, we, we as people who create characters, we understand the importance of balance. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, another really exciting thing happening right now is that we are officially rebooting the C3 Friday Forge on Twitter. Uh, the first one was a couple weeks ago and had a few of us creating magical girls in an 80s action movie genre blend uh, to some really fun results. Uh, then this last forge that just started this last Friday is blending pirate adventure with eldritch horror. And it's actually turned out to be quite an interesting blend of genres. Uh, if you're listening to this the day the episode releases, you still have time before the C3 Tuesday team up to create a character. Just look for the hashtag C3 Friday Forge and follow the prompt from the main character creation cast account uh, to create your unique character. Then on Tuesday, we'll group you up randomly and you get to create your own fan fiction, just like we do on the show. Uh, it's really fun and really helps the community get to know one another better. Yeah, I'd love seeing some of the stuff that comes out of it. I, I know I said this when we started it at the beginning, too. I have a hard time, like, keeping up with it while I'm working during the day. Um, yeah. But it is fun to kind of see the replies come through and the stuff people people make. Yeah, Pretty absolutely. Uh, finally, we are altering the format of our show ever so slightly. We're going to try doing these cold opens for announcements as usual. Um, and then we will end cap the show after the episode with a cold closer. So stick around before the closing music to hear how it's going to work. But for now, let's get on with the show. Yeah, enjoy. Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan, and this episode, my co-host Amelia and I are excited to welcome Celeste Konowich and Eugenio Vargas from the Roll20 Burning Daylight Cast, using the game we are covering today, Burn Bright, a Roll20 exclusive science fantasy RPG. Welcome to Character Creation Cast. We're very excited that you're here. Thank you. Excited Thanks. to be here. Yeah. Ready for all kinds of fun. Let's start by introducing both of you to our audience. Celeste, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself, um, other projects that you're working on, where people can find you? Yeah. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Celeste Conowich. I'm a freelance RPG designer out there in the wide world of the internet. Um, I'm also the producer and dungeon master for an actual play podcast called Venture Maidens. Um, so if you want to learn more about Venture Maidens or all the RPG projects, 
projects I'm involved in, uh, check out my website, CelesteConowich.com. And of course, you can find me every Thursday night on Roll20 running Burning Daylight. Uh, so, But we're going <laughs> to learn a lot more about that and burn bright in the, in the hours to come. <laughs> <laughs> And you, and you, how about yourself? Uh, yeah, I am uh, also a freelance uh, TTRPG designer and podcast producer. Uh, I'm the DM and producer of uh, The Last Refuge, yet another actual play D&D podcast. Um, you can also find me on Thursday nights with Celeste on Burning Daylight. Uh, I'm also a, a Twitch streamer and uh, designer and editor. Uh, you can find out uh, all the stuff that I have going at my website, EugenioVargas.com, or you can follow me on Twitter at, at DMJazzyHands. Awesome. That's such a good Twitter handle. <laughs> it's, a, it's a combination of a couple of different jokes, most of which come from college. Uh, but I did a student-written musical in college, and one of the characters was was DJ at Jazzy Hands, oh, yes. which I oh, appropriated I and turned into my handle. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, let's go ahead and get into this, and we will start by discussing what this game is all about. What's in a game? First, um, let's talk a little bit about the setting for Burn Bright. This game has kind of comes with its own setting. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so what's very, very cool about Burn Bright is that it does have such a strong introductory setting uh, for when the game begins. I feel like that's something that's sort of unique to RPGs because um, a lot of the time they want it to be as open ended as possible. And, you know, you might have like sort of a generic setting. Uh, but Burn Bright specifically takes place in one galaxy uh, called Olaxis. And the whole reason uh, Burn Bright is the title of the game is actually a reference to the history of of Alexis and what has been happening in um, recent times when the game begins. So essentially this galaxy, which is home to a bunch of different sapient species, um, there are no humans in this game notably. So there's lots mm. of different interesting species that have their own histories and culture. Um, but over time, you know, at the galaxy as it is, most of these cultures um, interact with each other in some way. Over time, they've warred, they've explored, you know, they've, they've expanded their life in the galaxy over the course of these aeons that they refer to as brights. Um, so the game's title, Burn Bright, is a reference to the current bright that the game takes place in. Um, and it's defined by this event known as the burn, which is this bizarre destructive phenomenon that has ringed the galaxy itself in this strange sort of energy that is ever encroaching closer and closer to the center of the galaxy. So everything the burn touches is destroyed. So that means planets are being consumed, you know, masses out in space are, are being consumed. Monsters are charging in from the borders of the galaxy trying to escape this bizarre phenomenon that nobody really exactly knows the cause of. So since they don't know the cause, they don't really know how to stop it. So this game drops you into this burn bright in a galaxy already in peril, having to face the fact that this burn is going to consume everything, probably within a thousand years or so. Oof. Yeah. So your adventurers are fully aware that this is happening. And basically they're out there in the galaxy trying to deal with life as it is, because a lot of people out there need help. A lot of people are being forced to leave their home worlds, you know, that are close to the edge of the burn. Space and resources are becoming an issue in the galaxy. So things are already tense and action packed, but also really hopeful uh, when you start the game, because there, of course, is the potential to find you know a way to stop the bright or just dis disc or the burn and to discover what it is um so it's already a very strong setting right from the get-go when you yeah. dive yeah. into this game oh wow that is some wild sci-fi going on there mm -hmm. yeah i was reading about it like reading through the like the background of it and i was like there's like already a cult that's like worshiping the burn and like <laughs> oh it's very good <laughs> Yeah, you know, not a tiny spoiler, but maybe that's what our Burning Daylight module is about that we're playing Ooh. in on Thursdays. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and where can we find that? <laughs> on the Rule 20 app. Uh, so streaming on Twitch every every Thursday night. Uh, you can see the game in action. And then also, of course, um, on YouTube, you can catch all those uploaded videos. So if you're confused by any part of this process, definitely go there and check it out because we, um, Eugenio and I and, and the rest of the cast did a, a pretty cool like session zero i think walking through character creation so you have two tools 
uh, to All learn right. it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, this might be a pretty easy question to answer then. What sort of things do we need to play this game? Well, that's kind of one of the great things uh, about Burn Bright is it was designed to be played on Roll20. So all you really need is a, a computer and an internet connection and a Roll20 account and a copy of Roll. Of and, friends. <laughs> and friends. And friends. Okay, so you need a ton of friends. And imagination. <laughs> um, but yeah, in terms of materials, it's it's all super simple. You know, we, the cast, uh, the players have, have been working exclusively on Roll20 um, because of the way this is is designed you know the dice are all handled on there the character sheets uh everything can be done directly through roll 20 and it's designed to do that so you know obviously roll 20 has has quite a bit of functionality for all kinds of different systems but for the most part those systems were uh adapted to the virtual tabletop this one was designed for it so it truly Mm -hmm. is you know all all included in that one system that's very cool what kind of stories and themes is this game meant to explore You talked a little bit about it being hopeful, even though there's like this constantly encroaching darkness or Mm -hmm. end of all things, potentially. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So what's really interesting is that there's there's a pretty big big like um, chapter or section, you know, when they're defining the world of the game that's that's written into the materials here. That is all about, you know. Yes, you are in this galaxy in peril and yes, you are facing potential, you know, annihilation. But it's also the fact that, you know, there are still hundreds of years between that moment where everything ends and where you are now when you start Mm -hmm. the game. So it's a lot about negotiating and navigating what you choose to do with your time, what you choose to do, you know, to, to support your family. What does making a home mean in a world that might be threatened the next day? Mm -hmm. You know, so it's all about evaluating what is important and what you can save and doing the best you can uh, to do that. So every moment in this game is sort of a moment of true heroism, you know, in, in that sense where it's like, you know, are you going to profit from people's misfortune? Are you going to help the less fortunate? Uh, where are you going to go and what are you going to do in the time you have left um, are, are huge themes for this. So, yeah, that that theme, again, of hope is is definitely there because there are so many victories to be won in a world where everything is in chaos and everything is, you know, so scary. Um, So, you know, finding a new place for a new species to live or, you know, bringing resources to those who need it most can be immensely awarding because it's it's the difference between survival or not in a very real way. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned a lot of things characters can do uh, in that response uh what else can characters do in this game more specifically i mean it feels like the game is you know celeste already mentioned it's about what does the end of the universe far in the future mean to your character Uh, obviously you know any game can be played however you want you can tell any story that you want my impression of the way that the source material is written is that it does lend itself to characters I don't want to say being the good folks, but like not being the bad folks. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. You could certainly tell that story with the burn bright system. Uh, But but I think what is much more interesting and and what sort of follows from a lot of what they have written, particularly in the player facing stuff in the in the game materials is is exactly what Celeste just talked about. You know, how do you make the galaxy a decent place to live in knowing that the end is coming? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you can do that in all kinds of ways. I mean, this is a science fantasy game. So if we're talking about concrete things the characters can do, they can fly in their uh, in their sentient spaceship all Mm -hmm. over the galaxy, not outside the galaxy. There's nothing left, but all over the galaxy. (laughs) you can go. As far as they know. uh, That's right. Well, that's true. That's fair. Uh, (laughs) But yeah, you there is a there are mechanics for outer space ship combat and and ship travel. So there's a lot of material there, uh, you know, if you're really sort of jones in for that sort of science fiction space type stuff um Mm -hmm. but what's interesting is because it's science fantasy there is still uh, a measure of magic there Mm -hmm. is still sort of a measure of that sort of fantastical intrigue that you can really Mm. dig into uh you know the the 
the burning daylight uh, module, I, I don't know any past what we've done so far, but what we've already seen in just a couple of sessions is that we're dealing with both sides of science fantasy, right? The, the science fiction part is inescapable, but this cult seems to have some sort of divine magic on their side or something like that. So it really is, you can really go a lot of different directions and the characters are at their core, just like I said, trying to figure out how to survive and how to make the galaxy a place worth living in for the next thousand years or however long they've got left. Yeah. Um, something too, that I really, the more I play this game and the more I play it with different people and, um, you know, different, different characters, um, it really just reminds me so much of that spirit of Star Trek in building, uh, adventures mm. because there are hundreds of planet systems in this mm -hmm. galaxy. So the galaxy itself is already huge. So there are still wor worlds that, haven't been explored or there are still um, species out there who maybe don't know the burn is coming. So you can definitely go for that, like those social kind of games. Um, but then also like there are, you know, floating abandoned space stations, like right on the edge of the burn that are rife with materials, you know, for plundering so that you can mm. definitely do those, you know, those find and, you know, get, get materials sort of games, you know, out there on the edge of civilization or, you know, there are, there are pirates in this world who are taking advantage of everything. There are monsters that are being forced in. So honestly, this game sets up a huge amount of things for creating the kind of experience you want. Um, they've, they've really built in a lot of ways your characters can interact with the world. And I mean, the adventure possibilities honestly just seem endless at this point. <laughs> <laughs> There's like a lot of threads to pull just from the little bit that I've read. Exactly. Um, yeah. Like a yeah. lot of different directions that you can oh go depending gosh. on what kind of game you want. Yeah, and I don't think we've covered a game yet that's had this like major galactic sort of feel to it. Yeah. Um, aside from maybe um, what was the, what was the uh, millennials in space game? Traveler. Traveler. Yeah, but I think that's that, the only other space game we've really covered, yeah. like a Star Wars. But. Yeah. Um, but this this one feels like very like there's very concrete places that you can go to mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm that really kind of reinforce that this is a living galaxy oh, yeah. and whatnot instead of like uh, Star Wars where it's like, yeah, you've got the movies and the TV shows and the cartoons as a backdrop and you're just kind of playing in that space, uh, no pun intended, uh, well, a little bit. Um, pun always intended, pun Ryan, always, don't lie. <laughs> it's very true. You're a dad, pun always intended. <laughs> it's very true. Uh, it's just natural at this point. Um, but... You're, you're basically saying, you know, we've got so many different worlds and it sounds like you get to help create these worlds as your players and, and uh, the GM. Uh, I'm really excited to dive into what this is all about. Um, yeah. I love space. We've <laughs> covered it a little bit. <laughs> yeah, space is great. <laughs> Gosh, space. Got space. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, talked a little bit about it, but what do you feel like makes this game truly unique from other games that you've played? From what I've seen so far playing it, uh, it takes a lot of um, it takes a lot of mechanics from other systems, from other, uh, at least in my experience, from other slightly lesser known systems um, mm -hmm. and really fine tunes them. So as we'll mm -hmm. see when we get into the actual character creation, um, the way that characters advance, uh, I have seen in other games, but Burn Bright sort of uh, gets it gets it more right. They have integrated it in a way that makes more sense to me. I'm being vague because I know we're going to talk about this later, so we'll get back to this. <laughs> um, uh, there's also sort of uh, the way that they have, the way that they explain the way that skills work and the way that dice rolls work. Um, it is general and vague and sort of a, it reminds me of a rules light system where it's like it's more about the narrative and then we figure out how the dice rolls fit in. But they've they've made it concrete enough Right. That mm -hmm. it's it's not opaque and it's not, you know, you, you don't spend a whole ton of time like uh, debating whether or not this is an appropriate use of this. They've given you enough that it feels concrete and uh, and and sort of easy to grok fairly quickly. So mm -hmm. I think that's for me sort of one of the things that I've really grown to love about Burn Bright is all of these uh, other mechanics that we don't see in. Well, for me in D&D, &D, which is what I mostly play, uh, mm -hmm. that. I've seen before and, you know, liked ish or, or thought could use some work. And the work was done here with this system. Yeah. 
Very um, cool. Yeah, something I also love about this game, um, and we'll touch on it a little bit during character creation, but um, the way that combat in this game is set up is so unique compared to a bunch of other systems. It's really, really player focused. Um, and literally in the way it's structured, it uh, prioritizes the fact that the characters are heroes and they do amazing things and the rest of the world has to work around that. Um, so much in the fact that like during the phases of combat, the GM like announces what the all the enemies are going to do. And then before anything happens, the characters get to react and go into that like action superhero mode and, you know, do their actions. And then whoever's left gets to move forward with what they're doing so oh, and the whole yeah the whole game itself is really built to to just you know celebrate the characters themselves and everything like Johania said the the skill checks and everything it's all about how the characters want to do things and then really the gm for this game is just an arbitrator or a referee um, they're not like this big controlling force that i feel like sometimes they are in other games it really is a dialogue and very player forward and focused mm. yeah combat is actually exactly what i was thinking of when i was saying uh about about the way that the rules uh, center the narrative without being too vague to really be able to grasp. Yeah. Um, th for example, in the last, well, I'm not sure when this episode will be coming out, but <laughs> as we're recording the last episode that we, uh, that we had the last game session that Celeste and I had of the game, my character uh, in, we were in combat and my character did damage to an enemy combatant by being very stern with them and telling <laughs> them what I gave them a piece of my mind, which is a fun sort of narrative thing that you can do in any right in any narrative focused rules like game. Mm -hmm. But I felt empowered to participate in combat in that specific creative narrative way, because in the rules, in the book, it talks about how you can do mental damage by using mental and social skills, right? That combat mm -hmm. and damage in combat is abstract. And here are ways that according to the written out rules as written, that was redundant, uh, <laughs> you, can, you can get creative and do damage. And yes, that's the way the game is meant to work. Because really, words do hurt. Don't they? they? Do. <laughs> <laughs> Even no, it sounds people. like it kind of hit that sweet spot between like those really like narrative yeah. games where it's like you can do anything, and it's like cool, yeah. but like how? Yeah, those games scare me, so I'm very glad. <laughs> yeah, I love yeah. them, but there are times where you're like, I need, I need a little like, put me on the road so I know where the edges are. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. I just need, yeah. I like. Send me into the forest, but I need a path to get through. Yeah, right. And and you know, some people thrive. Some people love. Apparently, it's none Ooh. of the four of us. But some people really love <laughs> right those those very open ended system games. And, totally. And I think you could probably absolutely use the Burn Bright setting and the Burn Bright rule set to play a game like that oh, because definitely. it isn't mm -hmm. super restrictive. But for those of us who want some rails that we can then go off of, right? Uh, it, it does a great job of giving us those. Hmm. Very cool. Yeah, I like it. All right, so uh, now we talk a little bit about the history of the game, for those not familiar. Um, I know it was released this year. Uh, do you know about how long it's been in development for? It's been a long time because yeah. Jim announced it on our show before 2019 Gen Con. I want to say I've heard James reference three years of development. It's been a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, James being James Intricasso, one of the lead designers on the game. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. who unfortunately and... couldn't join us, which is a bummer, but... Hi, James. Hi, James. <laughs> we miss you. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's it's interesting that it, it, we see that it was about three years in development, and now we finally got released, um, and it's it's just been an interesting journey to see it. It's been in, uh, played up. Uh, a version of the Burn Bright rule set's been played on Autonomic, mm -hmm. uh, which is a podcast out there. Um, and I can already see the extremely different scenarios, like worlds that have utilized this sort of system. Oh yeah. So it's pretty sweet. 
Yeah, I mean, it's one of the big draws, you know, when when Roll20 approached me to GM for this was the fact that it was such a new system and such an exciting system, um, you know, because they have spent years developing it. But I mean, a game that's designed specifically for a virtual tabletop in the world we're living in right now, like mm. what an, a powerful, what good, good thing to like, <laughs> you know, get right and be be a part of um you know from mm -hmm. from the beginning it's so so exciting i mean as we're recording this it's been out for less than a month at this point mm -hmm. um so as you know Eugenio and i are, are playing through burning daylight which is the only module so far that's been published for this game because it's so brand new um mm -hmm. it's it's exciting because we're you know some of the first people doing it and playing with this system and um you know showing it off <laughs> to people in, in a lot of ways but i think what burn bright has to offer is really innovative and so cool and also so important uh to yeah, you absolutely. know to explore these games that you can play on these online tabletops because you know this is the future of gaming right here mm -hmm. and it's interesting because that's uh, that's how i play most of my games i don't really have any local friends that do gaming all of my gaming is online so having something that is like specifically developed for that is interesting as opposed to like the the myriad of ways mm -hmm. that we kind of make it make work our games work <laughs> yeah. online yeah. because like obviously you can do it and you know you can get your dice bots in discord and you can do all of that kind of stuff but it's it's a lot of like little pieces pulled from here and there so it's mm -hmm. very intriguing to me to have a game that is entirely made to do this, like this one thing, this one way, and to sit down and say, like, this game is meant to be played online and we're going to make it work. Mm -hmm. Before we jump into character creation, we usually like to kind of run down some terms and concepts that people might need to know so that they understand what we're talking about. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about skills and dice usage in this game, how that kind of works? Sure. I mean, you're you're the math guy, Eugenio. So do you want to talk a little bit about, about the sure. skills in particular? You got so excited about this. I did. Celeste is, <laughs> Celeste is telling on me because when we did our session zero in the uh, in the compendium, in the rule book, uh, the character creation section that talks about skills actually has a table of probabilities of success based on uh, your your skill ratings and the difficulty of the test. And I nerded out about it um so <laughs> someone has to truly uh so there are 18 skills in the game that are uh broken up uh into three basic genres uh mental physical and social and each of these skills has a die rating from d4 to d12 uh and we'll get into how you assign those when we actually build the characters but all you need to know for right now is that each of your 18 scores will have uh a die rating d4 through d12 uh you always have to have at least one skill of each die size uh, and we'll talk more about why that is the case later but when your gm tells you that you need to uh, i believe that it's making a test in this game right is the is the verbiage that they use is that uh, right uh complexity well hang on let me <laughs> oh no oh, oh no. no i don't remember <laughs> uh you make a something roll a test a skill roll well anyway uh when so you get told that you're gonna make a roll you will roll uh, uh the the gm will tell you you should make a roll here it is complexity X. Uh, mm -hmm. That'll be the difficulty of the task that you're trying to accomplish from two to seven uh, is basically mm -hmm. the range of difficulties. And the complexity tells you how many of those dice you need to roll. So there's complexity two. You're just rolling two of whatever your die rating is. Complexity seven, you're rolling seven of them. You succeed as long as no two dice show the same number. Mm -hmm. So which is such a cool mm -hmm. like. When I first heard them do it on Autonomic, too, like, it took me a minute to be like, how does this work? And then, I, like, my son was sitting in the backseat of the car, and he's like, well, obviously, if you have four <laughs> dice and it's a four, like, you're going to... And I'm like, oh, okay. Okay. Oh, All right, okay. so like my eight year old's explaining to me the math of the probability of this. And I was like, oh, okay, I got it. I got it. That's amazing. <laughs> so basically, it. a child can understand it, uh -huh. but a grown up. They just don't yeah. match. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. So every, everything is a skill roll. It's just a skill roll. Oh, it's just a um, skill roll. Okay, yeah. great. Well, there you go. I was trying to make it complicated. So, uh, yeah, so that's, that's, uh, that's basically all it is, right? You get told the complexity, uh, you roll that many dice, and as long as they don't come up doubles or triples or quadruples or whatever, as long 
long as they don't match, uh, you succeed. And for me as a math nerd, what's really interesting is how quickly the probability of you succeeding plummets as the mm-hmm. complexity gets higher, right? Because mm. when you first think, oh, the complexity, you know, the complexity goes only from two to seven, it only gives you six levels of complexity, right? How hard could it really be? Yeah. But imagine trying to roll Very a complexity, hard, f- even five roll, right? If you've got a D4, you can't do it. It is mm-hmm. literally impossible if you're rolling complexity five. If you've got a D6, you've got less than a 10% chance of succeeding on a complexity five, and it goes down from there, right? So it's a really yeah. interesting system. Um, I'll talk real quick, uh, since we're talking about skills, about combat. Combat is basically the same, except that when it's your turn, uh, you can take as many actions as you want until you fail one. Uh, Uh And every action that you take, you're going to make a skill roll and every subsequent action that you take, the complexity increases by one. So you're starting with your first action as a complexity two. And then if you want to take another one, complexity three, if you continue to succeed four, five, six, you can stop at any time because if you fail, the GM also gets to to do horrible things to you. Uh, (laughs) But you can keep going if you want, as long as you don't fail. And again, talking about how this rule set is written and how it centers the narrative, but gives you stuff to cling on to. There's a whole section uh, in the rules about why this is the way it is. And they explain the increasing uh, difficulty in combat as your adrenaline, right? When it's your Mm. turn and you're starting, you get that zing of adrenaline. You can do anything. You are a hero and everything is relatively easy. But as time and your turn goes on, you start to get wary, the adrenaline starts to burn off, things get a little harder, your muscles start to flag, your brain starts to slow down, and so things get progressively more and more difficult until you have to stop, finish out the round, take a breather, and start again. It's interesting. So if you get to seven difficulty and you succeed, the next roll's still seven? Or that do you have to stop at that such point? a good question. I actually don't know. I don't know if it's ever been done. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's, what's interesting is there, and we'll, we'll get into this, but there are so many reasons that you're going to want to be grabbing different skills and different dice sizes all the time. Mm-hmm. That I, I, I mean, certainly if you really wanted to like game it, I, I'm sure... <laughs> It is someone somewhere <laughs> will play this game and do six actions on their turn in combat yeah. and succeed at all of them. And blessings upon you. For figuring <laughs> out. But uh, <laughs> yeah, going all the way to some, 11. Right. <laughs> uh, but because of some of the other uh, the other mechanics with uh, picking your skills and picking your die sizes, uh, it, it, it makes it even a little more difficult to imagine actually getting through that many actions in combat. Yeah. And also, Ryan, let somebody else have a turn, honestly. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry, I'm just on fire today. (laughs) Your turn's been 15 (laughs) minutes long. (laughs) It's not my fault. It's roll 20 for rolling all these good (laughs) dice for me. Yeah, (laughs) and I guess kind of bouncing off of, you know, what Yehenia mentioned this, um, that when we're picking our characters, um, what's kind of neat about this game is, you know, you don't have, like, a a job or a class. Um, What you do have are species abilities Uh, so these are abilities that you get to pick from a list um, generated by you know there are eight playable species in this game um, and each one has access to like a list of 20 different special abilities and you'll pick a few um, that kind of you know dictate what because even within each species there's a huge amount of diversity and variety about um what you look like and what you can do and what your powers are um so those oh, almost like people <laughs> like That's people amazing. it's amazing Whoa. what a concept <laughs> yeah. people are different from each other <laughs> yeah so these uh these special abilities are something we're going to pick during our game um but there are also kind of secondary abilities uh which are called nova abilities um so there's a really cool mechanic in this game um like was mentioned before that encourages you to use a bunch of different skills um so not just the skills that you have you know d12s in and you're super good at um because the only way to generate something called nova points is to use one of each type of die um Mm. so that means using a d4 skill a d6 skill a d8 skill a d10 and a d12 and once you've done that you generate a nova point And these Nova points can be used 
used for Nova abilities, which are oftentimes super cool, awesome, like species magical like abilities that, you know, are just extraordinary in the course of this game. So when we're making our characters, we'll be picking these special abilities and then also these Nova abilities, uh, which, you know, we'll we'll see interact in the game basically as you generate Nova points and, you know, are encouraged to use all of these different types of skills. Interesting. Do you have to succeed at the role? You do uh, not. To, oh, that's you just have better. to. You just have to try. Failing forward. I yes. Like it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, other than that, I think maybe well, we might run into some questions uh, over the course of character creation. But another yeah. thing we probably want to explain is called Argent which is uh, like the money system in this world. Um, so Argent in the world of Alaxis, you know, they've decided that using like coins and things like that was pretty wasteful when you have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of systems with different planets and cultures. Mm -hmm. um, so they decided to use Argent, which is actually a magical species that's sort of like plankton. Uh, and mm. basically what they do, I mean, these plankton, they keep them in, you know, vials and tanks and they, they do breed over time, which is sort of like interest. Um, oh. And they <laughs> they trade these vials of, of this argent. So when you want to buy something, you'll you'll literally trade a big tank for something really expensive of argent. Um, and oh. every ship in the game comes equipped with a tank where you can seal away argent that will, you know, grow over time and generate money for you like bank interest. So if you have 100 argent and you seal them for 100 days, uh, you'll have 110 argent. And that, oh. that's a mechanic that's actually built into the game. Um, so we all will get some argent uh, starting to, to buy our equipment um, during this character creation process. I don't know anything about storing argent because our cast spent every, every single every argent single that little we microorganism <laughs> <laughs> and then some. Uh, so we have not sealed any away in our. We ship. have some IOUs. I was gonna say calculating the interest on that though sounds like right up your alley with all these. Does it a little? Maybe one day. <laughs> Maybe one day. We'll have enough I'm to seal get out away. my argent spreadsheet. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And I think the only other thing that I had a question on uh, when I was looking at some of the pregens uh, was the story paths. Is that anything we need to get into before going into character creation? Yeah. So that's we'll, more like leveling, isn't it? Yeah. So we'll we'll get into that um, as part of creation. But um, every character will choose a story path, which is sort of like a secondary plot line or goal that the character is trying to accomplish while going through whatever the main adventure is or, or okay. something. So there are a ton of these different story paths that are everything from like earning a beast friend to like you know being on the run to immersing yourself in different cultures to falling in love um whatever these are these are cool like um yeah other goals that your characters have mm. um and basically every time you hit an event of one of these story paths you get to level up some skill or uh get access to new special abilities so it's mm. it's the it's the leveling mechanic in this game which is okay. cool because cool. it's actually story driven it's like right there in the yeah. title and um, we get to define some of that at character creation yeah so we'll all get to pick a story path uh, when we Ooh, get there i like it yeah all right. Uh, anything else before we dive in? Oh, let's do it. All right. Yeah. Let's make some people. All right. Let's make some people. All right. So I've got uh, roll 20 up. Everybody's got a character sheet. Yes. Um, we are using the Burn Bright system. I see the branding all over the place. So I know I'm in the right spot. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so what do we need to do to start? Because this isn't traditional pencil and paper uh, character sheets. They're not like form fillable PDFs or anything like that. This is all right in Roll20. And if you're not familiar with the Roll20 interface, uh, there's like a bio and info tab on your character sheet. And then the actual character sheet itself um, with a few options on there. Yeah, uh, yet another reason that this really, you know, again, it was designed to work on Roll20. Uh, they have they have put their character mancer to work uh, and this guides you through every step of character creation. It's really only like maybe a seven step process or something, but mm. this will go in order. Uh, it'll walk you through 
uh, and you just sort of click through and fill out the fields that it asks you for. So the first thing that we'll want to do in the character sheet on your character sheet tab is click create a PC sheet. There mm -hmm. are other options uh, that the GM can use to create NPCs. Um, the ship, as I mentioned earlier, is sentient and has a personality and has stats of its own. So there is also uh, an option to create a sheet for your ship. But for right now, we'll just stick with the create a PC sheet. Uh, okay. And the very first thing that pops up is that Roll20 will ask you if you'd like to use the character answer i cannot imagine why you wouldn't it Use makes it. it so <laughs> simple it's a gift <laughs> all right so yeah would you like to use the character mancer yeah might as well so this looks like a like a walkthrough it's got some tabs at the top uh welcome species culture story skills abilities equipment then review um and a bunch of uh fun stuff down below that so very cool i like this uh, I'm really excited because I actually haven't built a character yet for this game. Ooh. I have GM'd a bunch of different games for this, but I get to make a character today. How fun! I'm really excited when full-time GMs come on for that. You gonna pick a bug species, Celeste? No. <laughs> was that, no that was a very quick answer. No. <laughs> um, there are not, eight not a bug person. <laughs> There, well, it's just I'm a little burnt out. Uh, so there are eight playable species in this game. And of course, for Burning Daylight, uh, we picked uh, three of them are bug themed species. Oh. And of course, of the eight and the, the players all picked all three are there in the game. Oh, yeah. There are four and, players. Three of us are bugs. And in all the right. other games I've played, uh, I have had a Zavoy every single time. So I am just... <laughs> And as a boy, as a giant slug person, we'll get to it. But like, <laughs> ooh, people love it. People love the bugs. Um, I look. I mean, look, you're I, you're preaching to the choir ooh. here. About my character in Burning Daylights as a boy. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, y'all, you will all learn what what a joy, what a delight. <laughs> the a boy are. I will I say it's really it. nice that when you go through the drop down and like you pick one, it automatically like populates that info from the book yeah so like if i picked driftling right away it like pulls up the info for driftling so i don't have to like go yeah. back because i do have the compendium open in another tab but i don't actually have to no because it, it's all right which there it's really kind of nice and that that will carry through the entire process there will always be the right side of this window will always have information about the choices and the skills and the whatever that you're creating at that point that you're choosing at that point yeah, very cool. So you don't have to go searching. Yeah, I see a uh, not a lightsaber, lightsaber. Mm -hmm. One of these. Oh, oh, somebody's oh, yeah. already down on the equipment, are they? Mm -hmm. No, no, I'm just, looking, I'm just looking at the picture. Uh, oh, at the wow. picture. Oh, 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 oh. The, yeah. The so you know. The Eno, yeah. yeah. So oh, I guess we should say, so the very first tab is uh, your species, right? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. So one of the eight sentient, uh, sapient uh, uh, species, not races, which I yeah, am finally hard. starting to not say, yeah, but it is hard. Yeah, when you play <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons so much, right. not saying races, because they're all, uh, yeah, species, and they're all sapients, because, um, mm -hmm. you know, they're not humans or humanoids at necessarily. Mm -hmm. Small gripe, it does put character name right here, sure and I am does. not ready for that. <laughs> you can change that at any point in the process, so <laughs> yeah. so don't there feel pressured. Are, you know, wait. There are a few yeah. dire warnings if you try and finish the sheet without filling it in, but we promise you can go back and, you can, and adjust it You can it change later. the character name. Um, yeah, so how do you want to go through these eight species? I can definitely give a little breakdown. Them or we can just yeah let's uh, let's um, give a little breakdown that. of them. Uh, there's eight of them. Yeah, and I know virtually nothing about them. Cool. Very cool. Let's do it. Um, yeah, do, do you want to go like one 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 yeah. off? Okay. Yeah, cool. I love it. Do you want to start, start uh, so oh, that I I'll can start. get Savoy at the end? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you and your slug people. Um, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> okay, so there are eight playable species in this game. Um, what's cool to note about the world of uh, you know Alexis is that there are hundreds of sapient species out in this galaxy. But to start for this game. It's just these eight to choose from. I'm assuming that later at, in 
points in time. They'll add more um, as we go along. But our first step on the list is our driftling. Um, so the driftlings are infinitely plastic organisms with no definite form. So they are the shape changers of Olaxis. And what's interesting about them is that they can incorporate different parts of different species that they like, and then they just kind of take the best of uh, you know what they want. So maybe they want to have four arms today. Maybe they want the face of a Zavoy and you know the body of an Eno. And they they're constantly changing their forms to suit both their moods and then to discover their own personalities. Um, and what's what's really interesting about them too is that their home world is actually an incredible horribly dangerous planet that's filled with monsters and just like horrible things. So the minute that they got the ability to travel into space, they basically left their planet in droves. And <laughs> since they are so, you know, interested in in exploring the world and then like defining their own personalities by mirroring those of others, uh, they're really drawn to being explorers or to being mercenaries or just basically anything that travel takes them out and traveling around in the galaxy um so yeah there a lot of their abilities are about being able to change their forms um adapting to different environments and uh that's sort of the driftling the next species on our drop down list is the glean. The glean. Uh, gleans are adorable. Uh, yes. Gleans are feathered aquatic creatures. Um, oh, I love them already. Yeah, they're I look, amazing. Like, look at this art, so and I'm like, it's so oh. cute. Um, <laughs> Gleans are these uh, brilliantly creative creatures. Uh, in their natural form, they actually only live to be about five years old. Uh, hmm. But they were discovered uh, way long ago by uh, what in this setting is called an omniscient. But essentially, you could think of it as a god uh, or a very powerful magical creature. They were discovered by this omniscient named Black Ice Koa, I think. Mm -hmm. I've yep. lost the part of the anyway, um, who uh, saw their potential as innovators and creators uh, and and helped them to create something called reliquaries, which are these excuse me, these devices that allow the Gleans to live more than five years uh, so that you can play them as an adventure. Uh, and uh, so. When you choose uh, a glean as your character, you also choose uh, the color of your reliquary because these reliquaries have sort of um, ancestral sort of genetic memory. And so depending on what sort of reliquary your glean has, keeping them uh, alive and able to survive also outside of the water, there are certain personality traits that the original glean who had this reliquary has passed down to all mm. of the other gleans that use that reliquary and some of them are uh you know one of them is well the one that i remember because as we were doing character creation i felt a little called out uh was that one of them uh the they each have sort of like a pro and a con so the pro of of one of them is that it makes you even more artistic and creative and the downside is that it makes you really need approval and to be liked and i just felt called out um oh so podcaster <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, and actors and musicians I mean make the yeah. whole list and I'm on every step of the way yeah. my, uh, <laughs> my other favorite is that the one that makes you more polite but also you're hungry all the time hungry. <laughs> just so hungry <laughs> I, I saw that one I like, oh, hungry. that's a move yeah. I love it um, so when you choose the glean, you also choose which reliquary you have, which tells you what color it is and what personality traits you may uh, you may also have um like I said, the Gleans are incredibly creative and innovative. The Gleans are the uh, species that created magical intelligences or that brought about the first magical intelligence, which is uh, what is imbued in spaceships uh, to make them work. Uh, so oh. every uh, almost every spaceship, there are niche cases uh, called boomers that don't make use of magical intelligences. But for our purposes, all spaceships have a magical intelligence. It is a personality that runs your ship. And the Gleans were the ones who uh, figured out how to get access to them and to create spaceships using them. Hmm. Um, I love, I love Glean. They're I love Glean. <laughs> they might be my very... favorite. Already, like, 
Yeah. Oh. Well, yeah. Well, Amelia, let me tell you, uh, there, oh, you're going to feel that more. way about several of them yeah. because I was yeah. so sure that I was going to be a glean. And then we kept going. I was like, oh, maybe I should be this. Oh, maybe I should be that. Oh, maybe I should be this. <laughs> yeah. So get <laughs> ready. Yeah. Get I don't know. The, rex, the next one I've already decided is what Ryan's going to pick. Yeah. Oh, okay. right. So next what? up on our list, we have the Eno, which are sort of anthropomorphic cats um so the the feline species in the galaxy so the eno um have a long and complicated history in alexis um but essentially the root of their culture is all about um wheeling and dealing and trading in favors so they actually don't even have a system of currency on their planet everything you do is a favor that you trade for something else uh which is a policy that you know adventurers also have out in the universe so they might do something something for you, but they will definitely expect you to do something in return for them. Uh, and their home worlds are built around this concept. There are four main ruling families on Eno, um, and basically each of these families controls a different aspect of, you know, um, of government. So everything from, you know, security to like agriculture. Um, and then these, these four ruling families have carried the Eno through massive waves of expansion and warfare and um, basically during the war and Alaxis, the Eno were responsible for a lot of like arms dealing, um, but they also are great diplomats and spies because they're just so charismatic um, and all about, you know, the, the politics of what's going on. I, I like to say that the Eno, it's sort of like Game of Thrones constantly um, on the Eno <laughs> home world. Uh, so, so the Eno are, are known, yeah, for their social skills. Um, and then they're also just an incredibly powerful uh, species as well. So that's sort of the Eno. Uh, when you do play one, uh, you have to choose which of the four families that you come from, which determines a lot about your social standing and your ties and your wealth uh, when you start off uh, as an Eno. Ooh. Okay. We are now finally at our first bug species. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> I'm just looking at this list, and actually by going second, I, I have all three bug species. Oh, good. <laughs> Do it. So I'm so happy first, for you. I know, I'm so happy. So our first <laughs> bug species is the Kithuk. Uh, the Kithuk are these uh, large, chitinous, insectoid uh, creatures, uh, and they're a fascinating... Their culture is sort of this fascinating dichotomy. They are... Um, Generally speaking, their society is very friendly, uh, very close knit family units, familial units, communities in their society. But they are also powerful and skilled warriors. Um, and and they have had to sort of be both throughout their history. So their home world was actually on the outer reaches uh, of Olaxis, and it was one of the first uh, to to be destroyed or or anyway consumed by the burn. And so they were mm. very early on in the burn bright, uh, chased from their home world, from their original home world. Um, they since then they have uh, spread inwards and uh, they eventually learned to make spaceships so that they could actually get places and escape the burn. Uh, and they were taught that by a, a species that we'll talk about a little bit later, the Ulrens. Um, but again, a, a species of dichotomies, the Ulrens taught them to make spaceships. And now uh, the Ulrens have sort of turned on the Kithuks as they have spread throughout the galaxy and the rivalry, the enmity between Ulrens and Kithuks is is sort of well known throughout the galaxy. Uh, so so they're they're this sort of species. Well, several of these are, but they're a species without without a real original homeworld left. Um, they're also, uh, as far as I can tell, they are one of the few or possibly the only playable species that has a very um a very codified religion, not just sort of belief in gods or higher powers, but an actual organized religion that is a, a big part of many of their societal groups. Uh, so again, you know, they're just sort of this fascinating combination. Our, we have a Kithuk in our game and our Kithuk is, uh, and I think this is sort of 
a perfect tin type of the Kithuk is modeled after Uncle Iroh from uh, Avatar, mm -hmm. The Last Airbender, uh, which is very much how I see these creatures. They are loving, they are caring, and they are not to be trifled with. One of the, or the free ability that you get when you choose a Kithuk as your creature, or as your species, uh, is that you can do something called a defensive stance, a defensive position, where you lock your carapace together with other Kithuks to form sort of this single, powerfully armed armored unit, right? Mm. Which is, again, yet another sort of perfect metaphor for this species. Mm. Yeah. Also, they're like, yeah, they're like six and a half foot tall, seven foot tall yes. ants. <laughs> also, <they're, laughs> so let's <laughs> let's not I, forget that. <laughs> I buried the lead on that, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, so next up on the list, we have the Peacecraft, uh, which are uh, semi-organic uh, sapient robots basically um and starting would, off would you say that they're in disguise oh boy um <laughs> not gonna dignify that, that. No, I was like, the, what a weird no, thing to ask she would not no. <laughs> uh, um <laughs> So the uh, God. Uh, so the the peace craft. Um, they when you start off as a peace craft, you already stand like nine to ten feet tall, um, starting off. And every peace craft was actually built to be worn as like a mech sort of suit. So all peace craft actually have a place that you can sit inside them. Um, and the peace craft were built originally by a, a species that was warring with each other on their home planet called Pax. So these people basically were at war and basically had this arm race to create these peace craft that they were using to destroy each other. And they were so effective at building these peace craft that basically this species got entirely wiped out. So leaving mm. only the peace craft remaining on the planet. And the peace craft at that point turned to each other and were like, okay, this is terrible. We hate war. It's awful. Our cities are ruined. Our creators are dead. We will never fight again in a major war. So the peace craft are an incredibly peaceful race. Um, they refuse to get involved in any of the wars that take place over Alaxis and prefer instead to pretty much go on humanitarian missions. Uh, so a lot of the peace craft um, involve themselves with organizations that help get food to people or help evacuate refugees. Um, basically, they're they're highly skilled beings um, that are just dedicated to not creating any more war. Um, and what's sort of interesting about them is that part of this decision, you know, to to remain living on this planet um, and to continue as a species, they decided that no more peacecraft would ever be built. So there are only about 10,000 peacecraft in existence. And peacecraft, in a way, are immortal because whenever a peacecraft dies out there in the world, basically as they live, their memory and their personality is constantly being backed up onto the servers that live on PAX, on, on their mm. home world. They call them the heart servers. So if a peacecraft is out there and gets destroyed or dies, they basically just take the information and download it into a new body that they build. So these 10,000 peacecraft, you know, are just constantly reborn whenever they're destroyed. Um, and there is sort of this embargo to like, no more, we're not going to make any more um, of us. But what's interesting is now that um, it's been discovered if a peacecraft flies into the burn, their personality and everything is wiped from the home world servers. So for oh, the dear. first time ever, the peacecraft are having to face the possibility of actual death. So the way they're dealing with that and the scientific discoveries they're making and the missions they're going on are definitely keeping that in mind now. Um, so the the Peacecraft have a lot of really cool abilities that are all about, you know, changing your form or like popping out gun turrets or like wheeling around like, you know, uh, like a tank or, you know, pe putting people inside yourself to protect them or to heal them. Um, so the Peacecraft also have a lot of cool abilities to interact with spaceships. Um, yeah, that's, that's the Peacecraft. They might be my favorite. I like robots. Can I take back what I said before, Ryan? <laughs> <laughs> you, you did call the, the two that I was heavily, uh, choosing between so far. So. <laughs> I know you well. I know. <laughs> 
Well, we haven't mentioned bugs in a while, mm. so. Yeah, here we go. Uh, next up, we have the Rornin, uh, our second bug species. Uh, the Rornin actually are uh, swarms of bugs. Uh, these are uh, individually, they are tiny little blue beetle-like insects, uh, but they swarm together and create collective consciousnesses, which is what you play as an adventure. Um all of these species have sort of uh, some degree of sad history with the burn and the Rornin are no exception. Uh, their home world also was destroyed uh, relatively early on in the appearance after the appearance of the burn. What's particularly tragic for the Rornins is that their uh, originally every single Rornin bug, individual bug in existence was connected to one singular consciousness uh, mm. that was that was sort of uh, connected and hubbed at a queen. Uh, they were the Borg, but good, but nice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, their queen refused to leave uh, the home planet as the burn approached, believing that perhaps there was hope on the other side of the burn, or perhaps the burn didn't mean destruction or death. Um, whether or not the queen was correct, we don't know. Uh, but for the for the Rornin that did leave the planet and were not were not taken into the burn, they experienced sort of massive mental trauma when all of a sudden, when the queen was consumed by the burn, they were severed. Their their mental connection from the rest of their kind was completely severed. Uh, and it took a long time and it took the ARC, which is this organization that sort of plays into a lot of the adventures that you probably will have. Uh, it took uh, scientists and and frankly, therapists uh, of of the ARC to help these creatures uh, learn to exist separately from one another and to learn to create smaller hive mind units, which are how we see the Rornan now as sort of, uh, you know, maybe uh, maybe a hundred thousand ish bugs that are all together as a quote unquote individual mind, an individual creature. Mm. <clears throat> As as a people, many of the Rornin sort of uh, sort of hope that they can one day rediscover the secret to connect to a grand hive. Uh, and so that makes them inquisitive. Uh, it makes them very curious. It makes them uh, often sort of uh, willing to to ask questions regardless of, you know, how how appropriate it might be in the moment. Um, they also are uh, they have very strongly in their societies uh, uh, this concept of sort of the collective good, obviously, because they are, in fact, a collective uh, and they will often sort of adopt uh, their adventuring companions as members of their of their hive or of their horde or of their swarm or whatever you call it. Uh, and so they will be very, very protective and loyal to their friends. Mm. Yeah. Also, they eat metal and can squeeze through tiny places because they're just bugs. And they have lots of psychic powers. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know. Standard. Standard. Well, if I was going to choose an insect species, uh, that would probably be it. Oh, so. you say that now. <laughs> just wait. Just wait. <laughs> uh, so next up on our list, we have the Olran. Uh, and the Olran are crystalline humanoids. Um, so their bodies are completely made of a hard crystalline substance. And basically, as they age, their bec bodies become more and more uh, inorganic, um, up to the point where death for a Rornan actually looks like you're completely petrified and can no longer move as your form oh. has become completely crystal. Um, and so the Olran have an interesting history that's sort of built out of necessity because their home planet sits at the very center of Olaxis. So mm. as you might imagine, a lot of people want to be at the very center of Olaxis. So Olrans have constantly had to defend their home world from people who try to live there, who try to take over, who try to take their resources. So the Olrans have developed as an incredible, powerful uh, military culture. So over time, as they've been involved in, in many of these wars, um, this, this culture has become even stronger. So much to the point, every single Olran has to serve military service um, in their 
in their upbringing. Um, so all Ulrans are, you know, have some skill as either a pirate, a, a pirate, uh, no, <laughs> a pilot or a soldier or like a field medic. Um, and in Ulrin culture, you know, they have a long memory about the you, war heroes who have, you know, led successful campaigns. They have lots of, you know, beautiful sculptures honoring these these heroes and monuments to past battles uh, is something that's that's huge uh, in Ulran culture. Um, and uh, what's what's sort of interesting about the Ulran is that this, the, you know, this pride in their own culture and, and heritage manifests so much that uh, when Ulrans die on the planet, they actually often choose to dedicate their bodies to the defense of the Ulran homeworld. So when they become completely crystalline, they actually launch these bodies up into space and use them to form a literal protective shield around the planet that is composed oh. of ancestors and your elders so you're donating your body to defend the home world like that's, that's the level wild. of patriotism and pride the Olren people have um what's also really interesting about Olrens is um because their home world is considered the safest place in the whole galaxy with the burn it's often um odd for Olrens to choose to leave their home world to become adventurers because it's like, why would you leave the safest place in the galaxy? So mm -hmm. when you do play in Ulran, it's uh, usually the reason why you're off of your home world is a big part of your character and something to consider uh, when you're, when you're choosing to play them. They also reproduce asexually. Yeah. They split the, off uh, pieces of themselves and yeah. uh, grow into to new people. Yeah. So wild. It's, um, it's really cool. I mean, the, the zoology and the biology that went into designing these species is fascinating. I know um, Darcy Ross, who is another player. I was going to say, I see Darcy yeah, in some of these. Who, uh, <laughs> so Darcy is also a player with us in the Burning Daylight game. Um, and Darcy did a ton of design work on this game. And, you know, you can see the science shining through in a lot of mm -hmm. these uh, these characters, the species, you know, the way they the way they reproduce and the way they, you know, use their abilities. It's, it's very, very cool. It actually feels like real aliens. You know, that's some that's sometimes like a problem I have with Star Wars or, or Star Trek to an extent where it's like, oh, it's a human with a face prosthetic. And it's like, uh -huh. but it's basically the same. Right. They're all yep. the same kind of alien. Uh, this game, they are wildly different. Um, and you really feel that when you when you play them and when you pick them, which is so much fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the old ran. All right, are you ready? I'm oh, so, so excited. Ready. I'm here for the, the legendary. <laughs> our our All right. third and go. final, but certainly not last, but certainly not least of our bug species. Uh, and, and the last one of the eight playable species are the Zivoy. <sighs> the Zivoy are a giant <laughs> five foot long white slugs that can inhabit corpses. Hmm. <sighs> That's it. No. <laughs> That's it. That's all you need. Sold. No. Um, so the Zavoy, uh, as I said, are these big, long uh, white slugs. They actually don't. They um, I mentioned with the with the Rorn and that a lot of these species have direct sort of tragic histories with the burn. The Zavoy homeworld hasn't been consumed by the burn yet, uh, though it is sort of now on. Uh, in the outer parts of what remains of the galaxy. So many Zavoy have left their original homeworld. The original homeworld um, had some issues even before the burn, though, that makes Zavoy uh, society and personality sort of interesting. There was a, a massive nuclear accident uh, mm. on the Zavoy homeworld that basically made uh, made a future of that planet being completely uninhabitable, very real. And so the Zavoy adapted and ha became these incredible recyclers and conserve conservationists uh, to make continued life on their planet possible. And many of them will take that, even if they leave their home planet, many of them will take that sort of philosophy with them. Waste not, want not. Uh, I, I will often sing uh, the Rocco's Modern Life Recycle song uh, <laughs> during our shows or, or small snippets of it so we don't get sued. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> um, 
Waste not, want not. Uh, the Zavoy take that waste not, want not to a whole nother level, though, uh, in their main uh, species ability, which is inhabit corpse. Uh, they waste nothing, including the bodies of the dead. In fact, they, they are truly just big slugs, right? So there's only so much that a, a big giant slug could really build and create. Uh, and so what the Zavoy are able to do is they can inhabit uh, the body of any dead creature uh, of a certain size, there are restrictions, whatever, it doesn't matter, um, mm-hmm. and animate it and use it uh, to move about the world. Uh, and depending on the Zavoy, some of them have the ability to uh, sort of read the corpse's mind and know its memories, to be able to use some of the skills that that person had in life as if the, the Zavoy knew them. They have all kinds of abilities, but but the main point is that Waste Not, Want Not goes to the extreme with these folks. And, and while many other species may view the Zavoy's inhabiting of corpses as uh, odd at best <laughs> and uh, perhaps offensive and blasphemous at worst, uh, the Zavoy are making use of the resources that are available to them. Um, this ability does obviously give them the ability to sort of serve as, uh, uh, you know, spies and infiltrators and uh, gives them a lot of opportunity for skullduggery and, and infiltration and, and secrecy. Um, but, you know... No tool is good or evil. It's how you use it. <laughs> so this is just like next level necromancy. Yes. Yes, <laughs> yes. it is. Yes, yes it which, is. I mean, Amelia, that's right up your, your alley. Oh. It is. If you can get past the five foot slug thing. Yeah, I mean, I can. The art makes them look pretty cute, which is, I'm going to say, does. they're only redeeming <laughs> Yeah, that's, you know what? I love them, and I love Atash, my Zavoy in our game, but that is 100% fair. <laughs> I also, I should just posit that I have a irrational fear of slugs just my whole life. It's been a problem. So when I saw this, I was like, oh, man. And I also knew immediately that at least one cast member was going to want to be this, because, like, how can you pass up the opportunity to a creature that can wear other creatures? Uh-huh. I, I know. You, you just can't. You just can't can't pass that up <laughs> uh, and i can't well and as i as i talked about when we were doing our session zero and when i chose the zavoy you know it, it for for someone like me who who loves playing with character voices and accents and things like that like what greater opportunity than a creature that inhabits creatures with different vocal apparatuses oh yeah so Ooh, i enjoy yeah. it uh, so that's the Zavoy, and that caps off uh, our eight playable species. We spent a lot of time on it because this really is sort of the central. This and culture are the two really central yeah, parts defining of defining parts mm-hmm. of the character. Yeah, yeah. Um, both, both sort of in a narrative sense, and also as we'll see, uh, also in a mechanical sense as we go a little further down this process. Yeah. yeah. I really enjoyed learning about Burn Bright. This is a really interesting setting, and it, like, there's a lot of cool possibilities happening in this one. There's so much, yeah. Uh, so um, we created a really fun group of aliens, and I can't wait for everybody to hear all about that. But before we head out for today, uh, how about a review? Yeah, reviews are fun. Uh, remember, you can actually leave reviews on Apple Podcasts. That's probably the best place. Um, I know the interface is garbage, but uh, you can also leave reviews on Podchaser or um, any number of other places where you can actually leave reviews. I know Podcast Addict has reviews as well now. Um, We'll check those places where we can, and when we find reviews, uh, we'll read them out on the air. Uh, They make us feel amazing when we get your reviews, so uh, definitely keep uh, keep leaving them. And this Uh, is our last one. This is our last one from Chaos Nix uh, from Canada on iTunes. Uh, They titled it Great Show. Ryan and Amelia both do a great job in facilitating exploring several systems fairly rapidly while being very friendly and inviting. It's great if you're considering branching out from something such as D&D. This podcast has opened my eyes to quite a few unique TTRPGs. Until recently, I'd been very much stuck in D&D 5th edition and thought I was pioneering when I was considering taking a look at Pathfinder or an older edition. Now I have a backlog of several different systems I want to try, including Spire, Blades in the Dark, and Questlandia 2 when it comes out. So 
Thanks for that. Well, thank you for your review. Well, thank you. That was yeah. I'm I'm always excited to hear that people are like finding new games. There's I mean, there's such a plethora of stuff out there that like mm-hmm. gosh, even I don't know where to start and I feel like I'm fairly plugged into the to the tabletop world and even I'm like I uh, yeah. Where? Where do I go? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, I'm glad. I'm glad we're helping people figure it out. Yeah, me too. Uh, what? Well, this has been fantastic. Um, I can't wait until the next episode. So uh, let's uh, go ahead and close things up and have a good day, everyone. Yep. Enjoy your week. Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. We gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com where you'll find other great shows like Design Doc. Join hosts Hannah Schaefer and Evan Rowland as they redesign a role playing game. Design Doc is an experiment in public participatory analog game design. It's fun. It's messy, and you're invited along for the ride.